Let's go. I said, Walter Jones. Who is it? I said, Walter Jones. What's his name? I said, Walter Jones. Who show is this? I said, Walter Jones. Who is it? I said, Walter Jones. Say it again. I said, Walter Jones. Who are you with? I said, Walter Jones. One more again. I said, Walter Jones. The Sir Walter Jones Show with co-host Alvin Carter. We are a Christian talk show in which we tackle all the hot topics in the believer's walk. It's Fireside Friday. Grab a cup of coffee, sit back, relax, and be encouraged in the Lord. Hello, hello, everybody out there. This is Sir Walter of the Sir Walter Jones Show. He's back. I am back. Thank I am God. back. Thank you, Jesus, for your deliverance. I was laid out like a like a dead man yesterday uh, in the bed of affliction. <laughs> if anybody out there know what how it feels to have a twenty four hour bug, then you. You can sympathize with me. I sympathize and empathize. Been yeah. there, done that, got a t-shirt and a hat. Oh, uh, it felt like pure death. Uh, you know, Isn't it amazing? shivers. I couldn't I couldn't warm up no matter how many covers I had on. And, and then uh, you get too hot in the midst of the cold. Too hot, yeah. Yep, and then my uh, my head was pounding like somebody was beating it. Inside out. And, yes, that's, been... that bug ain't nothing to play with. Um, and I only remember only maybe three times in my entire life getting hit with that bug. Mm. Like the last time was in the 1980s. I mean, that's how far back it was. Uh, so we are trying to uh, do a um, a routine here in the studio by wiping down these microphones. Because, mm. you know, we have other personalities here who use the, the studios. And we've got to be very careful and, uh, and uh, make sure we take care of the people of God. Uh, because the life you say might be mine. <laughs> 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 Amen. And then... Well, we got Davinia who's come on in. There. Yeah, you, you right there. Yeah, uh, got Davinia who's who's in, there and she she Tuesday she uh, was sniffing. We all went out Tuesday and went over to Leona's over there in the, in the neighborhood, mm. <clears throat> which is never mind me. We're gonna go back and uh, kind of segue that into the topic today because we're talking about black finance. Yes, uh, but we went into the African American neighborhood to eat Tuesday, but uh, there was nowhere to go. That, yeah, we're going to talk about that. And uh, she was sniffing at the table, and then I started feeling something in my throat. And and was trying to figure out, okay, what's going on? Do I need a lunch or something? <clears throat> uh, I woke up that morning, and then, bam, it hit me real hard. So I don't know who gave it who, uh, but uh, <laughs> she she just walked in. She looks she looks better, and I look better than what I did yesterday. We've hmm. got um, David Rogers, who will be coming in in a minute. Uh, I just told Alvin that I gave David Rogers the wrong address to the the studio. But he got the Holy Ghost. He can discern his way. He He know God very well. He does. I gave David Rogers my home address. He texted me, asked me, what is the address to the studio? And I gave him my home address. He done told the truth. Yes, I did. He actually lives here in UBN. (laughs) You know, and that's his fault. You know why? Because I have invited him to the show. Several uh, times. Yep. And, 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 Giving him the address. Uh-huh. Several times. Several times, yep. And there's something that always came up. Mm-hmm. Now he wants to be uh, on it. And, uh, well. <laughs> so I gave him the wrong number, but I gave him the right street. So I'm sorry, Pastor David Rogers. He'll he'll be walking in any second now. Uh, for So for those of you <coughs> who uh, listened in yesterday to the show, I want to thank Pastor Eric Hayes all the way. From Indianapolis, Indiana. Yay. Uh, you know, I love my friends, and I, when I tell them I want them here, I mean it. I send for them. And he actually uh, came. And he came. And he was suited, booted. Yeah, I mean, he, he came here like he was ready to preach the like revival. A, I know. That's that's that's, he that's was Hayes. Sharp. That's Hayes, man. Man, he was sharp. That's Hayes. That's the way he is every time. Uh, Looking like a skinny red salad. <laughs> and he's uh, extremely knowledgeable on the subject of creation versus evolution. And those of you who missed the show... Please go to Spreaker.com, Spreaker.com, and the show is up, and you listen to the the, yes, the, the entire show. The is entire there. show is wonderful. I was sitting there crying in my in the room trying to break this this d- d- demonic <laughs> attack, and I was enjoying the show. It was healing to me wow. because uh, all of the, uh, the 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 intellectual banter that was going back and forth between the two of you and and, and Art, 
Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, it Two was, of us and uh, uh, wow! It was it was absolutely amazing. Wow! Yeah, and a lot of it was for meat eaters. Okay, a lot of you who drink milk might not be able to handle some of the content. Uh, but if you meet, and eaters, I was trying to, uh, yeah, bite oh no, I know. I had to cut it down to smaller slices oh, for myself. Wow, it, it was it was amazing. So I actually asked for his notes. <laughs> Did you? Right? Yeah. yeah, I took oh, it with me. I, oh. He wasn't getting it back. Yeah, right. <laughs> Well, definitely, there definitely have to be a part two to that show. That's for sure. Oh, yes. Um, okay. Well, um, I've got my notes ready, and um, we've got uh, uh, a really, really interesting subject today. Facebook has already chimed in on this subject about uh, economics as it pertains to African Americans. Um, ebony e- economics, as uh, Alvin Dooley uh, calls it. The stats are in. And uh, 321,000 jobs were added. Uh, and this is the most in almost three years. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, unemployment rate remains at 5.8%. And this is a six-year low. Uh, job gains average about 241,000 a month all year, this year, 2014. And this has been the strongest job rate since 1999. That's, a, that's, what, fifteen years? Mm. Okay, that's a lot of years. But let's, well, I'll wait till you finish. But I have a question with that. With that sure, data. I'm, with I'm that done data. with the data. Okay, my question is: jobless rate, mm-hmm. unemployed rate down. Mm-hmm. But what does that really mean in real terms? Because everybody that I speak with that has a job now or has a new job. Mm-hmm. They're underemployed. Mm-hmm. They're working, which means that they un- they're not un- unemployed anymore. Right. But they're not making what they once made. Sure. So is that really better? Mm-hmm. Now, I'll hear some say some job is better than no job. Mm-hmm. Or is it just a smoke and mirrors approach to say that the economy has been flipped and the um, tides have turned to benefit the, as my union buddies would say, the bourgeoisie versus the workers. Hmm. Yeah, that's good. I think that a lot of standards have been raised and lowered in every situation known to man. Okay. Whether whether it's in our Christian walk, or whether it's in uh, whether it's in jobs, or whether in everything that we do, our standards have been raised or lowered depending on where we are. For instance. Somebody's going to look at these stats and say um, that um, any job is better than no job. Yes. Like you said. Okay. But I also believe that there are people who are settled. They just settled. Okay. I, okay. You know, I got a job. I'm, I'm I, you know, I wish I could make more, but I can't climb in this business, in this company. I just can't. I just, I'm going to be number 25, you know, who, who was, uh, who was in the factory who was uh, putting that thing on that belt, you know, he's number 25. Mm-hmm. He's going to be number 25 until he lead that company. All right. And I, and I think, I think it's all up to interpretation um, on, on uh, this whole job situation. I will, I will say though, that there are people who stop looking for work and you, how can you, you can't add them into this, st- this statistic. Yeah. Because they stopped looking. So this statistic really can't so be. The variable is vague. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you can't look at it as the, the go all of the, that ends all. Although these are great stats compared to what we had. All right. But um, how much of this has affected the black community? Well, that's where I was headed with the question, because even though the unemployment rate mm-hmm. may seem to be lower. Mm hmm. Has it really changed when you look at it through the microscope or a closer lens in the black community? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Has it really changed that much? Um, are we still at the same place we were the years mentioned in, in this, in this, or as today? Because sure. when you when you compare the the jobless rate mm-hmm. in the nation, mm-hmm. that includes everybody. Sure, but what about us? Okay, and. <clears throat> I think <laughs> it hasn't changed that much as far as we are concerned because the type of jobs that we were allowed to have mm-hmm. or the type of jobs that we have positioned ourselves to get, many of us still can't get them. I have a lot of friends who have 
paid a lot or owe a lot in college loans, <laughs> but they're not working in the field they've been uh, degreed in. Wow. And ain't nothing more frustrating to pay back a loan for something you didn't even use. You didn't use. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Because, I mean, the jobs that they have, man, I could have did this without a degree. Yes, yes. You agree with that, Davinia? Absolutely. And what you find in those situations is that – the way that they've set up the economy nowadays is that you have to go to college to get a job only to end up having to get a job to pay for the college. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? (laughs) It's true. And people are, you know, I worked as a, an admissions advisor for the past six years. And I felt like a loan shark Mm. because I'm sitting here selling people the dream of, Oh, if you're going ahead and go to college and pay $60,000 for this bachelor's degree, Mm. you'll be more marketable as far as being able to get yourself a job. And so a lot of these people, they're soaking it up and they're thinking, okay, well, I have to go to school. I have to pay this much money for tuition. But then once they graduate, either the degree that they were signed up for, is obsolete so there's no longer the degree is not even worth it's worthless now because now there's no jobs in that degree such as with the health administration services Mm -hmm. now that degree is completely obsolete Mm. to the point where there's no jobs for medical billing and code and that's what i meant to say medical billing and code was the hot degree to get back in the day and now that degree is now obsolete to the point where a lot of colleges don't even offer it anymore because a program does it now yeah exactly yeah Mm -hmm. we we have in a room here uh apostle david rogers who walked in who's a good friend of ours uh especially in chicagoland area y'all know his name you you you, you see on facebook some of you Y'all know y'all yeah. got arrested by him, some, too. Some of y'all got arrested by him. He's a former cop with Chicago Police Department. Uh-oh. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, and Shoot you. Lay yeah. hands on uh-huh. you. Kill Ra- you. Ra- then put dead. you in jail. Put you back. <laughs> you still got to pay you your pay. You still got to pay. The, 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 the man, the, the thief on the cross, he still had to die. <laughs> yeah, he still had to die. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so f- when you hear a lot of names in Chicago who are doing things in the streets, not just hiding behind the church uh, walls, uh, you'll hear this man's name, and I really wanted him on the show today. And Monday he'll be coming in again to talk about racism in America. Uh, it's going to be an interesting show because we're bringing in a, uh, a, a my white uh, minister and my brother Larry, who attends an, uh, an interracial church. So we're going to have a well balance. But uh, Pastor uh, Rogers, uh, I want you to respond on this statistic that I just gave. Uh, 321,000 jobs added, uh, the report that just came out. It's the most in three years. Unemployment down. Uh, four, uh, five point eight percent. Okay, job gains averaging twenty two, uh, two hundred forty one thousand a month this year. Every month is averaging that, and it's the strongest rate uh, since nineteen ninety nine. What's your response to that? Okay, <clears throat> uh, outside of my church stuff, I'm the chief marketing officer for National Catastrophe. Nastro- National Catastrophe Solutions. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're a construction a minority-owned construction company. Um, so uh, in terms of economy, when you talk about jobs, um, for us in our community, uh, being African-American, uh, you have to put that in light of business creation. Okay, Businesses create jobs. When you count a number, let's say 200,000, we have 319 million people in America. Mm-hmm. So when you say okay, we created 200,000 jobs. We need to find out where those jobs were and who got those jobs because those jobs are not in the south side of Chicago where I am in Roseland. Mm -hmm. Those jobs are not in Inglewood. Those jobs are not on the west side in Pullman or West uh, Auburn or Gresham. Those jobs are not there. Mm -hmm. And so we have to go to the root cause. We, We have a bad habit of swinging at the leaves and not dealing with the root. Here's the problem. <laughs> That's good. That's I good. Love that. African-American economics are invisible in industry. Yes. We have the ability to create businesses. Everybody got their little website business. We're doing all this little stuff, but we are invisible in industry. There mm-hmm. is no African-American airline anywhere. Mm-hmm. There are only, uh, there are less than 600 African-Americans that own hotels and there is not one African-American hotel chain. Mm. So when we start talking about economics, what we about always, Robert? Oh, they told Roberts down. I'm sorry. We we always mm-hmm. deal with it from a standpoint of okay, we are going to start a business, but we're so divided that we are absent in industry. Until you get into industry, you're always going to be broke. You're always going to be poor. You're always going to be looking for a job 
because you will always be victimized by the people who control things. Yeah. We don't control anything. So we thank God for the 200 jobs. We thank God for the 5% increase in employment. But the reality is after 2016, what happens to us then? Right. Because Ooh. every time the economy goes down, it impacts us the hardest because we don't control anything. That's it takes true. us the longest to rebound from it. So you're saying this, there should be more than mom and pop shops? Of course. Um, among us, we should have a Walmart owns 26,000 Walmarts. Mm -hmm. McDonald's owns 33,000 McDonald's mm -hmm. on seven continents. Mm -hmm. And we have a store on 46 in Indiana. Mm -hmm. One. Mm -hmm. So if we're not willing to work together to invade industry, we're always going to be victimized by the people who control things. Because when Walmart comes in, they're not coming in unless they're making $600,000 a month, right. which is going to shut mom and pop down. Yeah. And they're not going to pay their uh, workers a living wage. They're not going to even let them unionize. And so as African-Americans, oh, Walmart is coming. Great, wonderful. I can do all my Christmas shopping at Walmart. And I'm going to make $10 an hour while I'm over there. But the problem is Walmart controls that. Yes. And ultimately, as an employee, you will not have a living wage at Walmart. And Walmart, the Walton family, which is the wealthiest family on the planet, right. they're worth $152 billion. They're going to make sure that you don't have the time to invest in education and forward thinking to get into the industry. Because they're going to work you to death. Mm -hmm. And by the time you get home, you're going to be tired. And you're not going to have the ability to think critically on how to get inside of industry. Because that's, that's where we need to be. Inside of industry. Hope Foods is coming to the neighborhood. Uh, over there on 63rd and what, Halstead, I think it is soon. Yes. Um, you support it or not? Who owns it? Well, you know, we don't know Whole Foods. I don't support it. No, why? In fact, it's a, well, one, it's overpriced for our demographic. Uh -huh. They're very high priced. Uh -huh. Number two, it's a message being sent to say, if Whole Food is here, it's okay for you all to come back here. Okay. Because Whole Food may take link. Mm -hmm. But your link buck won't go as far at Whole Foods as sure. it would at Aldi's. Well, they and addressed that situation, and they said that our uh, we have um, an off -brand. adjusted. Yes, and they have adjusted their prices according to mm -hmm. the neighborhoods that they're in. That's what they said. Okay, so it doesn't then, help that's us. That's not fair, and it doesn't help us. Why name name, name one African American owned grocery store chain? We don't, don't have, have any. Mm -hmm. What happened? And, and this is what this is what messes us up. Um, they're, we they're, had they're, one years ago. It used to be an organization called the Black Alliance for Farmers, and they shut them down. Mm. Yep. Because there was a time where if you were an African-American owned business grocery store, you could go to the Black Farmers Association and you could get goods and services at a price so that you could be competitive. They shut that down. Mm. So now we are victimized by these people who get all of their goods and services outside of our community. They ship them to our community by transportation services that are outside of our community. Yeah, we can buy gas the from <laughs> they buy gas from gas stations that are outside of our community that are controlled by people who are outside of our community and all of those prices wind up in the goods and services that we buy. We have to become a lot more aggressive in our thinking and long term uh, thinking and planning and implementation so that five and six business owners come together mm -hmm. and we can start dealing with the root of this versus trying to get people jobs because they can give you a job and they can fire you because they're in it's control. Yeah, that's true. That what is, has hindered it? What has stopped it? Stop. What, Our I mean, families. Be, yeah. Be, be, come on, go a little deeper. The production Our, you're talking about? The what has stopped us from actu actuating that vision? Okay. okay, I come from a family of entrepreneurs. Sure. Um, in the In the sense that <clears throat> they told us to go to college while my dad, my uncles, they all went to work and were self-made businessmen. They didn't work for anybody. They worked for themselves, but they bought the franchises. Remember Clark gas stations? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, they were very Afro friendly. And when the Clark went under, my uncle started his own brand of gasoline service called Keen Super Service, mm -hmm. right on 95th and King Drive. It's now Popeyes and Wendy's. Mm -hmm. None of us had an excuse for not having a job because Uncle Bob could hire you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, that generation of African Americans said, you all go to college so you won't have to work as hard as we do. We missed that. What yeah. I mean by that is, we should have been able to go to college to be better business runners to come back and keep that family business going. Mm, that's now, what, what I'm talking your, about. Now, now, what you just said was, how come 
the generations now with all the knowledge, all the information, all the technology, everything that's available to us, all of our political leaders who say the same thing that you're saying, how come in six years it hasn't actualized? Or how come it hasn't materialized? As many entrepreneurs that are in Chicago, what is blocking it? You said families. It's, it's family. I've been in business my whole life. Um, from selling drugs I to now, say, I remember before. <laughs> <laughs> from selling drugs to now doing legitimate business, and this is what I find about people: people are always motivated by something. Yes, most people who are entrepreneurs are not motivated by money. That's why they succeed mm. because there is something that is driving them. the The life of their children after they leave is hmm. the thing that's motivating them to deal with root cause issues versus just the accumulation of money in our community. We've become materialistic and I'm just going to give you a a brief example of this and I'm going to be quiet. When hip hop first started, you the gas, you can't be quiet. No, (laughs) no record label would sign a rap artist. MTV didn't want them. Right. There would be, there was no venue for hip hop to come out of the projects to the mainstream. So they created an industry. They began to sell cassette tapes out of the car or they would sell them on the streets. As the economic power of hip hop began to grow, then the record label said, oh, there's money in Mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. And then they changed their stance and then they took control of an industry that they didn't want. When they took control of the industry, they changed the content. It was no longer uh, journalism about what was going on in the neighborhood. It became materialistic, misogynistic, because they decided in a boardroom that hip hop would be the springboard for a culture to keep them wealthy. Mm -hmm. And that's what they did. Now you have hip hoppers like 50 Cent, like Jay-Z and like P. Diddy that said, "Okay, you reversed it on us. We're going to reverse it on you. We're going to come out with clothing line. We're going to come out with a liquor. We're going to come out with a gym shoe. We're going to come out with jewelry. We're going to get into those industries that you thought you were going to keep us out. African-American culture as a whole and the church as a whole have not made that same move. So Sunday after Sunday, y'all going to be mad. They're going to, I told you they're going to kick me out. Sunday after Sunday, (laughs) we collect tithes and offerings to do nothing. Mm. Very true. We haven't purchased not one house, even on the block where Mm. we're doing ministry. Thank you. We don't own a store. We don't own anything. We fell in selling fish on Fridays. Talking about the Lord is going to make a way and you have no (laughs) capacity to hire one single mother in your church, but you haven't Seven and eight and nine offerings every Sunday. Yeah. It is disgusting. It is retarded. It is stupid. And until the people of God wake up and start reading the Bible correctly, everybody that Jesus hired as an apostle was a small businessman. Sure. Not one of them was a priest. And so what is God <laughs> saying about this? They were fishers. They were farmers. They were tax collectors. Not one of them was a priest. Right. Why did God choose them? Because small businessmen have the mentality right. that is global. Yeah. Church folk want to go to church. The they want to run around in a circle in the church <laughs> while everybody in the church is suffering in poverty and economic depravity. And we still have not had these conversations in these think tanks to bring all of this knowledge and all this expertise and wisdom together to even get in one industry, much less the eight that are governing what is happening even in the political arena. Because if you don't know it, corporations control what happens in politics. Your votes do not get people in. You're voting for people in the electoral college and you can't name me two of them. Was he there Tuesday with us at the t- dinner table? I'm sorry, I'm done. I'm going off. He <laughs> might have been there with he, us at the dinner table. Davinia, was, was he not? I think he was there in spirit. Yeah, he must, <laughs> we said the exact, exact same, same thing. thing too. Yes. Day. Off Absolutely. the air. You sound like me. Down to the electoral college. Down to colleges. the electoral college. Absolutely. Who's in the electoral college? Yeah. The people who yeah. own corporations and who are running industry. President Obama, in his uh, in his first election, he raised $150 million in one month in, an, in a recession. He did. So if we took all of the money that's raised for politics alone, the United States could pay down 42% of its national debt. He's telling yeah. me. Guess what that money come from, though? Guess where that money Us. come from? He and, raised that grassroots dollar, uh-huh. five dollars, ten dollars. There you go. Time. That's it. Mm. And that's where it comes from. It's the, it's the little foxes. I would tell and, y'all something. And, you better and, tell us something. Come on. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. You, you go ahead. Your last word. Go ahead. Okay. We got pip. So can, What's can Obama I tell mean? you another... Don't start. Don't, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> so do you know another industry, the same that you talked about with the hip hop industry, where it is currently happening right now? Black natural hair. And wow. I'm saying this. Wow. 
I'm saying this because in 2009, I started my own business with natural hair and skincare products. Mm -hmm. And that was back when natural wasn't really hot back then, right? right? A lot of women were still into the relaxers and they were still into the weaves, right? Yes. Well, now, a couple years later, we have fast forwarded to where everybody is going natural. You know what? Now, I think we need to talk about that Tuesday. I was looking for a topic for Tuesday. That's it. That's it. Okay. That's it. Should I be yes. quiet? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I love it. Crystal Waters will be here Tuesday. Ooh. I think that's a wonderful topic. Crystal, Ooh. I think you might be listening because she's shared Can we talk about nails too? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> yeah, I'm tired of uh, Mulan yeah. doing my nails. Mm. <laughs> Let's talk about that. Listen, I want y'all to listen to this sound bite, okay? As we go right into the break, the sound bite oh. is about six minutes long, okay? I want you to respond on this sound bite so you can't talk. This <laughs> is Alvin. All right? Respond on this. This was from, I was, I was on Netflix where they have all the documentaries. I listen to them every night. It's just wonderful documentaries. Uh, and this one here was called the, uh, the 1%, I think it's called. And um, when they got on the subject of Chicago, I was, I was amazed. I said, let, me, let, me, let me play this on the show. Mm. And uh, go ahead and play that, and then and we'll come right back. The south side of Chicago is one of the poorest inner city communities in America. But now rich people are moving in and creating some serious changes in the neighborhood. Mr. Pants? Hey, Mr. Pants. Come on in, Mr. Pants. Pants. Mr. Pants is my second kitten. I had a kitten growing up, and when I went to get King, my first Mr. Pants, my father told me, you don't have to buy the first kitten you see. Well, I walked in, he kind of came over and purred, and I was like, oh, I want that one, you know. First kitten I saw, I bought it. Well, buying a condo was kind of similar. I walked into this room, and I said, wow. You know, I've been in a lot of the coolest houses in Chicago. But I've never seen a room like this. Let's get this condo. So I got with my dad, and we talked about it. And I said, wow, i got to, like, run to an ATM and get the deposit and whatever. I was just freaked out about it. Um, 30 days later, I owned the place and uh, haven't regretted the transaction since. It's a very thought provoking place. You see the train go by, and you're reminded that there are other places in the country other than Chicago. And you see what used to be housing projects and are suddenly condos, and you wonder what impact you're having on the city and who lives here, who can afford to live here. It wouldn't be such a big deal if the change weren't so drastic. So these buildings used to be public housing. Now they're being taken condo. Sure, you put in new windows and you spruce the place up a little, but the fact is, that someone who was using the public housing system lost his home for each one of these units that's being created. It's happening too quick. Um, the new stores and everything and the new houses is too quick. The subway right there, all of this is, I mean, it's too quick, it's too, it's too, um, too make-believe to be true. Because, um, like five years ago, you would have never dreamed that those nice, uh, condos would be there, and then the subway would be there. Overall, I think gentrification is a tool that solidifies the stratification of classes. There are people who live in an area that becomes 100% people like them. Three big tools have been used in a lot of areas. First, you build a big police station. Secondly, you tear out all the basketball courts. And lastly, if there's a local public school that poor people attend, you tear down the school. They closed three schools up in our neighborhood. The middle school, the high school, and the uh, baby school. Why? We closed three buildings. I don't know. I guess they're trying to push us out the neighborhood. It's, it's, it's uh, decent people living in the project. You know, pay their rent, people work. You know, everybody ain't uh, the enemy. Hey! 
What's happening? Have you lived here your whole life? Yeah, I lived here approximately my whole life, 28 years to be exact. So this is the garbage they put up here that they pulled have been taken down because the problem they had is fixed. This is our lobby. The phones used to work when the police used to have a police station right here. This used to be their police station right there. What happened to that? We ran them away. Well, the people ran them away because they was on BS. That's our mailboxes. Half of the doors don't lock on the mailbox. Do, Do I have any mail? I ain't checked the mailbox today. No. Oh, I got a bill. Yep, I got a bill from a uh, Tribune that I never get the newspaper if they send it to me. The changes in the neighborhood is changes in the neighborhood around us, not to us, around us. We got one and a half school in our neighborhood. 35, 40 kids in one classroom with one teacher. He can't teach everybody all, you know, he needs some help. So that's why all the kids, when they go in class, if they ain't getting no attention, they gonna run away. This land is worth more than what the niggas over here can give them. So what can you do with them? Displace them and the ones that you don't want over here, you get rid of them. You get rid of them. You know, and what you use as an excuse, use the drug dealers, you use the cocaine house. You know what I'm saying, it's cocaine dealers. You know what I'm saying, you use the people that's over here doing nonsense to try to get rid of nonsense. We grew up as a family. You know, one building to the next building to the next building. You know, you can sit up here and talk all you want to, but yet still, we love our kids. This is my son. Come here. This is my son. Do you feel like your kids have an opportunity to get rich in this country? Hell no. Hell no. They ain't no rappers. My kids ain't gonna be rappers. They ain't gonna be, they ain't gonna be rich. It's easier to just cleanse the earth of these people, send them to the far reaches of the universe, and the mayor's office will build a big police station, build a bunch of townhouses, the yuppies will buy in and bougify it, and suddenly we'll have a community. Yeah, there will be a bunch of people displaced. Yeah, there will be a bunch of crime problems, but it's easier. We found the easy solution. Charles Darwin uh, did not invent the term survival of the fittest. That was Herbert Spencer, uh, a social Darwinist, who thought that if we just allowed the rich to get richer, uh, well, uh, that was good for society because we want to discourage the poor from having a lot of children and, uh, and, and basically surviving. That kind of social Darwinist notion has stayed alive uh, in uh, certain quarters, and I believe that it is there behind much of the economic policies we are now. Yeah, um, there you have it, right there. And that that was a crazy documentary. Um, and it was talking about, you know, you heard words of degenification, you know, the survival of the fittest, which I thought was a Darwin term, but but you know, it was from Herbert Spencer. Uh, survival of the fittest in the Chicago land area. Um, now we do have a caller on the on the phone here, and I want I wanted uh, also Apostle to uh, give us a response to that. Um, caller, are you are you on the phone? Yes, I am. Okay, who's this? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Who's calling? Hi, this is Amardo Cole. How are you doing, Amardo? Amardo, how you doing, Doc? I'm well. I'm well. Man. I think this is a a great great topic today. Thank you, brother. Thank you. What great do you have time. to say about this topic? Well, um, I think that um, there's a simple principle, and, and that is that pride comes with ownership. Um, neighborhoods don't get to the point where they become gentrifiable if they're not first run down, and they don't become run down if people uh, respect and appreciate what they have around them. You know, and, and that's a simple fact. And regardless of whatever the causation of um, the lack of respect for communities that are uh, we'll, we'll focus on black people, our, our communities, communities of color. Um, it's a reality. And um, one thing that you can point to is a one-to-one -one relationship between what's happening in, uh, in urban neighborhoods and inner-city neighborhoods um, is that, um, and it's going to be an unpopular opinion, but 
it's an opinion nonetheless. Um, with integration, there came a uh, a one to one relationship in the downfall of the black community. Right prior to integration, blacks had the highest level of employment out of any race. Okay, um, statistically. Uh, young people were working in black communities at the age of 12. Mm -hmm. Okay, Industriousness, ownership, you had black doctors, black lawyers, uh, black businessmen, entrepreneurship was the thing. Right. Okay, And something that uh, disturbed me in the clip was this man saying, you know, that his child would never have an opportunity to become rich right. because he wasn't a rapper. Right. You know, why, why is that the only vehicle to accomplish that? Right. We aren't teaching our children uh, to become doctors. We aren't teaching our children to become lawyers and that kind of thing because we don't see it around us. Okay. And uh, again, you know, we, we can point to all kinds. I just lost you. I'm sorry. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're back. Yeah. We can point to all kinds of causations as to why um, everything from, you know, Lyndon Johnson and uh, social reform, whatever. But the simple fact is, since in integration happened, there has been a steady downcline uh, in uh, decline, rather, in uh, rates of ownership, entrepreneurship, and also it's reflected in the family. So um, I'm not saying that we should go back to segregation or anything like that. Right. But one thing we've got to focus on, we've got to respect what we have. We've got to respect our neighborhoods. Uh, it, it's, it's a shame that uh, there isn't a person listening to this show who couldn't agree that they would much rather live in an area that was mixed than one that was ex exclusively black. Hmm. Wow. Uh, uh, Apostle, you want to uh, address that? Um, for for us in our community, I think history is really critical to understanding how we got to this point. It, it, sure. Uh, integration alone wasn't the problem. Uh, you brought up a name. Uh, you brought up the name of, uh, I believe you said, uh, Lyndon B. Johnson. Mm -hmm. He's responsible for welfare reform that forced fathers out of the house in order for women to get welfare. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We forget that. And so when the Democratic Party came up with that strategy, it was for the purpose of destroying the family to create the mechanism for poverty. Absolutely. We forget those things because we're in 2014 and, you know, we have some African-Americans that have achieved marvelous things. But as a whole, when you forget the lessons that your history teaches you, you're doomed to repeat them. And so Absolutely. now we have a new type of welfare. We have an intellectual welfare that has gripped our people now to where we won't even operate in just simple economic prowess for our families. And so at the end of the day, the neighborhood is only going to be a reflection of what we're doing in our homes. And in the materialistic, misogynistic culture that we've enveloped and we've endorsed, now this is what the results become. Mm. Your response, Mato? No, no, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, statistically, in, in the state of Georgia where I live, um, and I'll use uh, an example that's in the news, uh, you see people... Uh, trying to uh, vocalize the, the need for higher wages for uh, fast food workers and that kind of thing, right? They're pushing for $15 an hour, right? Statistically in Georgia, it's easier for a single mom to pr uh, provide for her family on uh, the mechanisms of the system, WIC, EBT, TANF, uh, Section 8, right? Mm -hmm. She can have a better uh, standard of living doing that and making fifteen dollars an hour, hmm. so I absolutely agree with what the apostle is saying. Yeah, um, and here's the it, frightening part, brother: they've already planned to eliminate <coughs> both food stamps and Section Eight in the next five years. Hmm. Wow! In the next five years, so all of this, you know, distractions that they've been sending with the Ebola and ISIS and all of this stuff. We're, we're, we're not reading the reports that they have to publish as politicians in their seatings and in their legislature, um, you know, sessions and their caucus sections on what they're doing economically in this country. So if we don't devise a strategy fast, 
all of the mass chaos that they're trying to create through all of these other means will be our reality. Mm. Mm. That's good stuff. Amada, I want to appreciate you calling me, man. That, that's, Thank you. That, that's, okay. some, that's some heavy hit. Oh, Alan, I, Alan I, wanted to say something before you hang up. Yes. I, when you talked about the communities and the neighborhoods, even with the mixed neighborhood, we have to look back in history. Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois were on both um, very prominent contributors to African-American history, but they were on opposite sides of the spectrum in one area, economic development. Mm-hmm. Whereas um, what we have now, in, inter, uh, I'm having a loss of words, segregation, desegregation, Booker T. Booker T. Washington wasn't so much about segregation in, in the regards of being able to use the same fountains and same bathrooms socially. He was never a proponent, uh, uh, an opponent, I mean, he was never uh, pro for, he wasn't a proponent for it economically. His catchphrase was, cast down your buckets where you are. And they overlooked that. Booker, uh, W.B. Du Bois didn't even want to talk about it. Even though Booker T. used his money to help the NAACP, but they lost the vision because they wanted the status versus the means. And we have to lose the focus on that. Now, I have to also touch on the minimum wage increase. What they don't realize is when they raise the minimum wage, they're going to raise the cost of living. Exactly. And it's going to work. It's going to benefit the bourgeoisie or the, the employers because they're going to change all their positions to part-time employment. And what's going to happen? The unemployment rate is going to go down because more people will have jobs, but they will be underemployed. So mm-hmm. it will look good on paper, but it will be bad in real life. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's called exactly. economic slavery. Yeah. If I give you $15 an hour and you think that that's all there is, that's where you will stay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so the problem is we haven't dealt with education properly in this country, especially as African-Americans. And it's it's appalling to me, uh, and I won't even talk about it, but there's a certain person now that's being in the news that was one of very few to spend their own money to keep black colleges open. Mm-hmm. Now he's being castigated in the news for mm-hmm. all kind of stuff yep. because he be- can see beforehand and they want to be- because of because of his support of black colleges anybody that invests 10 million dollars of their own money has the right to say whatever they want to say right but because we have not really created the type of economics that create businessmen we've created the type of i mean the type of education that creates businessmen we've created the type of education that creates students and this is why they are getting out of college with degrees and they can't come work for me because they don't know anything about business. They don't have a trade and they have no tangible skills and I think that is one of the main issues. So when you mention education reform, I think that you hit it right on the head. Again, I've worked in the industry for six years and I looked at the classes that were being offered. None of these classes give a tangible skill. Very few of them do. Mm give an actual tangible skill that you'll be able to take with you into just mm-hmm. about any industry, mm-hmm. or at least you'll be able to start a business with that tangible skill. Okay? Yeah. And, and here's the other problem. Those who are black business owners, where is our connection to the colleges so that our best and brightest who are there, who have the capacity to take point. our businesses to the next level can be recruited prior to graduation? Why, why are we letting them set the, set the standard? for our businesses. Most black businesses are one generational. Once they're gone, it's over because the guy who owned it, and and there's one really close to me, he owned it. He was a black grocery store owner, and I love this guy. And when he passed, his children had no capacity to do it because they decided to do other things. People who really, really care shop, buddy man. And there's no duplication. We have to be able to have a duplication process. If we have a a, a trade that we have, we have to be able to pass those skills on so that we can create legacies. But it's seeing value in what's being done. Work, making an honest dollar, is honorable regardless of what's being done. Um, what happened? What it was a time you can go and buy fish from a black-owned person. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with selling food in the neighborhood. It's mm-hmm. an honorable business that employs people. Yes. Getting a haircut. Mm-hmm. <laughs> now we have plenty of barber shops and beauty shops mm-hmm. uh, because it adorns our status and our focus there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But why would you hate the fact that people are these people are in our community making millions of dollars selling things to us that we naturally made ourselves? Yeah, we did. Amado. It it. it is he gone? 
Okay. It, okay. It, it's the family thing. Um, I grew up in the wild hundreds, of course. Um, when people are not taught to love themselves, they look for ways to mask it. So in our communities, this is why we're absent in industry. We'll go to the Chinese shop to get our hair and our nails done, get our eyebrows, our nails, and our toes done. Now, if a sister opens up a shop over here, well, she don't talk to me right. And yet, okay, well, they're talking about you. They're just talking about you in another language you don't understand. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But because we don't value ourselves, we don't value our brother and our sister when we see them in business. So we look for an excuse not to, you know, what they say on the street, mess with them like that. So we need to get healed as a people because you used a very important word uh, brother alvin yes, sir. you use the word value that speaks to culture and we have a culture of economics that's self-defeating and we have to change that by changing the dimension of our families because you get your value from your family and wealth is yes. connected to family yes. when you find broken families and dysfunction in family you find poverty mm-hmm. and that's global that's all over the world and so if we can heal our families, we can deal with the issue of economic uh, improvement and wealth in our community. Black-owned businesses in the United States increased 60.5 percent between 2007 and 2000, well, 2002 and 2007, totaling of 1.9 million black firms. More than 94 percent of these businesses are made up of sole proprietors or partnerships which have no paid employees. Nearly four in 10 black-owned businesses, that's more than 700,000 in 2007, operated in the health care, social assistance, and other services such as repair, maintenance, personal, and laundry services sectors, on and on. <clears throat> okay, now y'all think this sounds wonderful, but it, it continues. <laughs> Administrative support, waste management, and remediation services made up 11% of black-owned firms totaling 260. 216,763. Transportation and warehousing was the fourth largest industry, making up 9% of black firms. Okay, and watch this. Black share of the United States businesses. Despite the 60.5% increase of firms, 55% increases of receipts, and 13% increases of businesses with paid employees, black-owned businesses only make up 7% of all U.S. firms and less than a half percent of all U.S. businesses receipts, African-American adults ages 10 and up make up 10 percent of the adult population and are therefore underrepresented in the U.S. in terms of business ownership, especially when it comes to earnings. Uh, now watch this. Mm-hmm. At the bottom is Puerto Rican, then Native American, then Cuban, then Korean, then African American. Okay? Wow. All right? Uh, And then Chinese, Asian, Indian, Mexican, Hispanic, and Asian. So there are, there's one, two, three, four, five, there's five that are above us as far as increase in businesses. So the, the Chinese above us, Asian, Indian, Mexican, Hispanic, which in under it says all Hispanic mm-hmm. and Asian says all they're above us. So the only ones that's be- be- behind us is Korea. Okay. And Cuban and native American of course. Uh, and that, that's, that's what's going on now. The, um, the employed payroll of, of the 1.9 million black owned businesses in 2007, 106,000 had paid employees. That's in seven. Something happened between 2007 until now. So, uh, there was a breakdown. The states here says black-owned businesses accounted for 28.2% of businesses in the District of Columbia, which led the nation. So if you live in the District of Columbia, you, you, you're at the top, uh, followed by Georgia, where 20.4% of businesses were black-owned, and Maryland, where, 19, where 19.3% of the businesses were black-owned. Uh, so... What, what what's going on? At, at, does it matter where we live, you know, geographically, or is there just a stronger, well, you know, coalition? Well, that goes back to the industry thing again. African Americans are almost invisible in the technology industry. Mm-hmm. We're globalized now. If you don't have a global presence in the market, you can't survive, and that's just the reality. You're going to be outcompeted. You're going to be outbid. We are still 
in horse and buggy mode and everybody else is on leaner jets. Mm. And here's the other part that we never want to talk about and I always have to talk about when I get interviewed about economics. We have no connection economically to Africa. That's our homeland. Everybody else is connected to their land. Mm -hmm. When you come here, there's a Chinatown in every major city. They have Chinese signs. They have Chinese shops. They they eat Chinese food. Everybody's connected to their home homeland, but us. So when you come to an African American neighborhood, you see Arab stores, you have an Indian hotel, you have a Chinese nail place. It's not congruent because we're disconnected. We call ourselves black. I'm writing a whole book called Black is Not a Nation. And the reason for that is because when you play the black card, it automatically connects you to a culture that's disconnected. Wow. Wow. There's trillions of dollars of gold, diamonds, and oil in African land that we have yet to tap into. And other nations are doing it. And we're over here fighting for post office jobs and trying to get... Uh, hired in somebody else's corporation that hates our guts instead of going back to the root and dealing with what we can really do in a substantial way. I'm well, done. I would like to address that because there's a pastor from the Church of God in Christ, Nathaniel mm-hmm. Stanley from mm-hmm. Milwaukee, mm-hmm. who has established many ministries in those areas in Africa who's trying to establish diamond mines. But he told me that, that was, one, not enough support so that he can get help with the resistance that's being faced here. I'll help him. Um, well, I'll connect you to it. Um, number two, because he talked about the diamonds. But number yes. two, um, one of the things that we're not touching and what wiped out a lot of the black businesses is politics. Yes. we were over, When they started saying tax this and tax that, the black business suffered the most because they couldn't keep up with the taxes to keep their business open. And who raised their taxes? Most times it was the very party that we aligned ourselves with. Mm. So, he said it. I did it. And I will continue to say it. Um, the party that we aligned ourselves with for uh, um, uh, equal rights and all of that, they gave us equal rights socially, but they gave us unequal rights economically. So they said, I don't care what toilet you use, what fountain you drink out of. We can drink out of the same one if you can afford to even come in here. Yeah. So what does it say? Uh, Farrakhan said the best. Jim Crow changed his name to Jim Crow Esquire. Mm. And they use the law to paint it as if it's working in our favor, but it's working against us. Yeah. And we see it right now, even in this present and under this present administration. I don't care yeah. how many black folk I make mad. But yeah. as she so eloquently stated, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, she yeah. had to listen back to other shows to sure. get that response. Sure. So we have to look at it from that perspective, too. If tax breaks are going to be offered, they need to be offered to the black businessman as well. Yeah. But. There aren't many to receive the benefits of it at this point. Right, right. So then I have to challenge the church. Church, you have income, but you spend more out because you want to build mega churches to impress other preachers Mm -hmm. and not make an impact in Mm -hmm. the community. Now, when apostles said all this money that comes in, they're doing nothing with it. Well, they're doing something with it. They're casting their pearls before swine (laughs) because that preacher's being a pig because he's driving a fancy car, living in a big house on the backs of the other people. Sure. It's time for the church to use that income to bless the community. If Solomon's temple that he built for God wasn't that big, why we got to build one bigger and better than that? Yeah, well, yeah. I I drive to Skokie a lot. Skokie, Illinois. Oh, wow, Mm -hmm. yes. It's all Jews, okay? Jewish community. All right? And you see them with their hat on, you know know who they are. And they shop in their community. You hardly ever see them outside of their community. They shop in there, and their money circulates right in that community, okay? Because they have everything they need. From from Dempster, when I get off on the, on the Kennedy, oh, that's the Edens. When yes. I get off at Dempster East, right there is where Skokie starts. From from that street all the way to uh, the border of Evanston. Yes. Mc, McDaniel Street, I think it's called. Which is about fifteen lights. I've counted it. <laughs> yeah. All right. That's all. That's all Jew. All right. And everything they need is right there. And rarely do I ever see any of them outside of the, the, that neighborhood. I say to myself, Wow, what a powerful people! Because they read from the Torah. Yeah. What they were supposed to do, and they mm-hmm. follow it. Yeah. We read the Bible and we run around the church and shout, and then we give twelve offerings to yeah, nothing. To nothing. The Jewish community owns banks. Mm -hmm. They are a part of industry. So if a Jewish young man graduates from college and says, I want to start a business, the person that decides his fate is one from his own kind. Yeah, yeah. And this is what we're missing at. We don't have anybody. I I talk, one of my uh, spiritual sons, he's an actor. 
He goes out to Hollywood. He gets recruited for this big movie that they are filming here in Chicago. Mm -hmm. He develops a script for his own movie, and he goes to Hollywood. And I asked him, I said, son, you're taking the script out there, but which one of us, name me one person in Hollywood that can say yes to a black person script. And he said, dad, there's nobody there. Mm. Mm. There's not one single person in all of Hollywood that is an African American that can say go to a television or a movie. Wow. Not one. And and African Americans spend over a billion dollars a year on movies and reality TV and all of that foolishness that are created by someone else to create a mindset for us. And um, I wanted to um, expound on your point with the Jewish communities. There's a big, huge sign right off of Tui that says, mm -hmm. right by the church, that says 10% of your will goes towards the education of Jewish people. Wow. So that's powerful. Yeah. Because they have an established legacy. They do. And mm -hmm. they set it up to create more wealth for the generations. Yeah. That's it is good. an expectation. That's good. Where is that in the African American community? You said they're, tr they're creating wealth for the what they are creating wealth for their communities for the yeah. generation for the generation, generation. Yeah, posterity yeah. yeah they're they're thinking a hundred years from now we're mm -hmm. thinking about michael jordan gym shoes today right, right yeah. now they're thinking about a hundred years yeah. from now what does what does the impact of my business mean to my great great grandchildren that's good and mm -hmm. until we get some african americans mature enough yeah to sacrifice your personal well-being for the well-being of our future, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then we will continue to be poor. And that's scripture because they were taught to to give to in their inheritance for their children and their children's children. Children, children for their so they're thinking about their great grandchildren. You know, yes. I, right now my my daughter's twenty, okay, and I've been trying to do everything I can to build up her credit report. Yes, all right, because I don't want her. Come on, man, I don't want her to rely on anybody but herself and her. I want to. I said to her, I said, baby, in another few years, I want you to walk into the car lot or walk up to the bank or you know when you when they build these new houses, walk in there and says, here's my social security number. All right, go check it out. Right, and they I want them to be throwing it at you because right now it's time. But see, I wasn't raised, unfortunately. My, my parents didn't know to do that for me when I was 20. Mm -hmm. uh, they I, didn't know, they didn't know. You my know, my people are destroyed because for of lack, lack of, of knowledge. knowledge. Yes. I, well, let me say this now I have to, I'm sorry, I don't mean to play the, the antagonist here, but the credit report works only to a degree, but it can become a curse because if you have the credit, they will begin to allure you and pull you in to. Give you this, give you this, give you this, so that you will not have economic power. I have a friend um, who owns a business on the west side, and he says, I got what I got because I had good credit. But you have to be careful with good credit because they'll give you as much as they want you to have, knowing you can't have it all. This is true. And so then it comes the discipline. He says, so when I really started realizing some things was when I started saying no, they started respecting me more. Mm -hmm. right. So he said to me, make sure that your credit is good. But be able to not have to use it. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. I have a credit card that I only use for credit purposes. So you're right. It needs to be a discipline in everything that we do. So that's why, I, again, my daughter's 20 and I teach her. I said, now we're going to get you this credit card, this one, this, this card. I want you to use it to use it to spend. And because you already got money, because when you buy something with this card, take the money you already have and pay that card off immediately. Yes. Because I want you to be disciplined in your in your credit standing. Because a lot of y'all young brothers don't do that. That's why we mess up the, the lives of women. Right, because it's the, it's the inner it's the inner man that's broken. Yeah, I feel better about myself if I spend two hundred dollars on some gym yeah. shoes and some hundred and eighty dollar True Religion yeah. jeans because I haven't been told who I, who I am. I make this look good. This don't make me look. Wow, good. wow. Listen, y'all, we got to go to this break right quick. This is this is this is. This is uh I don't know what to call this album, but this is something. <laughs> it's enlightening. <laughs> and it's, it's provocative. It is, it is. I'm about to go in. I don't know if it's the heat or if it's the heat from Apostle. Okay. Ah, he's on fire. Yeah, he's on fire. All right, y'all. I don't know. We got a song here, CC. Yeah, give me something because we need to smooth this across. Some some civil rights, some some bring There's a, a change coming. There's a change coming. All right, it needs to be. All right, y'all. But don't go nowhere. We'll be right back. Log on to urbanbroadcastmedia.com and check out the many services Urban Broadcast Media provides. Whether it's social media, video production, radio broadcasting, or audio recording, we got you covered. 
broadcasting all over the world at urbanbroadcastmedia.com, delivering love and inspiration 24-7. This is UBM Praise. Sir Walter Jones Show with co-host Alvin Carter. We are a Christian talk show in which we tackle all the hot topics in the believer's walk. It's Fireside Friday. Grab a cup of coffee, sit back, relax, and be encouraged in the Lord. Fireside Friday, Fireside Friday, everybody. This is the Sir Walter Jones Show. If you just tuned in, you missed an entire hour of just us talking about uh, black finance. Uh, Wow, do I have an echo? What's going on here? Somebody, you know, CC fix that. Sound like I'm in a hallway somewhere, you know? Okay, well, I hope hope y'all let me know on Facebook if this sounds weird. Um, You look weird. (laughs) Hey, um, Apostle. Yes, sir. Uh, I watch a lot of documentaries on TV. Okay, mm-hmm. the Science Channel, the History Channel, some good stuff. I turn on this this station geared to black people. There's two: one called TV One, and another one is called BET, Black Entertainment Television. All right. Mm-hmm. Well, you don't have centric, huh? Yeah, well, centric too. That's right. That's right. Now, mm-hmm. you can watch that station, any one of those three stations, from 6 a.m. all the way until 12 midnight. All right, mm-hmm. and you will not get anything educational on it. No, anything that deals with something that's going on right now in my community, you won't. Now, I remember in the 1990s they used to have a 10 o'clock news on BET. Yes, they did. Mm-hmm. Yes, I forgot his Tabby name. Smiley. T- it was a woman too that came after him. 
Okay. As a matter of fact, she was a member of Faith Temple I had in Evanston. Okay. In my church. Uh, and they took it off the air. Okay. They stopped showing it. And they replaced it with mess. Okay. Videos, booty shaking, uh, 106 and Park and, and, and College something, College Hill, all these <laughs> shows. Okay. Because they were thinking of posterity. Posterity. They okay. the young people. Yeah. So what, what happened? What do you think? Because, you know, there's a lot of sellout in media. You know, I, you know, Motown. And a lot of the record labels who, you know, they, they left Mo- they left uh, the Motor City, Detroit, and all yes. those, and they, they they sold out to Los Angeles and what have you, and they said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sell my part of the industry, and I'm going to buy my house and retire, okay? Wh- why? Well, <clears throat> economics is mental. It's not money. Yeah. Ooh. Mm. Say that again. The person that controls the thinking controls the money. Wow. Because I can shift... I can shift an entire industry. This is why people don't understand. I, I, I worked for Burrell Advertising when I was in high school. Oh, I had, a, Burrell, had yeah. an internship. This is before they got the divorce. Sure. Uh, I was in commercial arts. I was, you know, in hip hop movement. I was drawing graffiti, and I found out that they paid people lots and lots of money to do this stuff. When I got, uh, we won the AXO at Kennedy King, and I got a two week internship at Burrell. When I went there, I discovered what marketing was. Mm-hmm. I would watch commercials, but I had no idea the power of marketing. Mm. They were the largest African-American marketing firm in the world. That's right. And I had no idea that marketing was designed to shape the mind. Mm -hmm. Mm. Marketing decides what's, we're going to go back to uh, Minister Alvin's uh, word, what's valuable. A Michael Jordan gym shoe costs $3 to make. Mm. That's it. They make it in China. Mm -hmm. Indonesia. Yep. Mm. It costs three dollars to make. Mm. Someone in a marketing firm for Nike decides that this shoe is worth a hundred and eighty dollars, mm. and then they bring it to America and they sell it to us for a hundred and eighty dollars. It's a three dollar shoe. Sure. Wow. So when I shape your mind through marketing and I do it through the music, sure. because uh, Fubu, mm-hmm. uh, we all know their story. They were all in the basement doing this before they solicited LL. Right. When they got LL Cool J on board, FUBU became, it went from a basement company to a global mm-hmm. power mm-hmm. because of marketing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The Be Like Mike, Michael Jordan, Gatorade mm-hmm. thing. That campaign, campaign yeah. That campaign, nobody knew anything about Gatorade except for folk down south. I was playing football in Texas. We knew about it. Sure. You know, Florida, yeah. that's, that was it. But they use the power of marketing to shape a mind. Mm-hmm. We don't understand that power. Mm-hmm. So we're watching programs, and we think that these programs have no power over the way we think, but our children are killing each other yeah. over yeah. this stuff Influence. because the power of marketing has shaped their mind to believe that that shoe means more than your life. Wow. And until we, again, control media, because we don't, we don't have any real black stations. We don't have any real black news outlets. Mm-hmm. So we're only getting information from people who decide what information we get. They decide. Because if I tell you a lot of the truth behind some of the stories we get, sure. it would create a greater uproar than what we're having. Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. But we'll deal with that Monday. Yeah. So oh, yeah. how do we... <laughs> oh, yes. I can't wait for Monday's show. But how do we go about shifting that? What are some solutions, some tangible Thank solutions you. that you can give us? Well, I'm a strategist, and I believe in unifying people who are like-minded. We have kids that are going to Columbia for broadcasting. Why do we have to wait for them to get hired by Channel 5? We're in an Internet now. Everything is moving out of television into the Internet. Mm-hmm. In the next five years, there won't be a television. If you want to watch what we call now television, you're going to have to go to the Internet because everything is Internet. That's right. mm-hmm. So now why don't we get a Walter Jones or an Alvin Carter and then we take these kids out of school that have all of the idea and all, all the ingenuity and creativity and begin to create broadcasting networks through them that will cost us way less than what we're dealing with in terms of television that mm-hmm. we see now. Like the Christian stations. This is why I've never gone on a Christian station. If you get on a Christian station, they charge you $2,500 for a half an hour. Mm. Mm. Y'all think I'm playing? Seriously? Go look it up. Oh, no, no I I'm serious. It. I know. $2,500 for a half an hour. Now, with that same $2,500, I could buy me a laptop and I could get me the new Roku, mm-hmm. the new Roku oh, thing. Yes. And make a YouTube channel. Goodness. Sure. And I can go global. Watch this. I can go global for one-tenth of what it would cost for me just to have one half an hour show. I can mm-hmm. have shows 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Residual. And touch the globe. 
Mm-hmm. But again, mm-hmm. it takes forward thinking individuals. That's so we've got to we've got to identify who those individuals are, and we need to start sitting at the table and actually doing something and be committed long term. Because us as a folk, we'll jump on something. You know, we're gonna be on this mic ground thing for about two more weeks. Folk gonna be laying out in the streets for two more weeks. We're still not gonna and address the issue of it. police violence. They'll be over I don't know it. why you mm-hmm. blocking traffic. That's not gonna stop the police violence. But yeah, yeah, because because <sighs> let me your, be quiet. Your friend Chris Harris Senior. And um, our, our, our Catholic brother <clears throat> has decided after service, y'all, y'all run Don't out of your churches streets. and y'all run and you block and traffic <laughs> this Sunday. Okay, because of this. I love Chris Harris. That's my brother. I love him. I love him dearly. All right. Uh, but there is a um, there is there is a decency that we still should represent in Christian dumb. That's a word that Alvin hates. <laughs> Um, <laughs> that we we still should be guy. yeah we still should be man we have okay. to deal with the root yeah yeah help me with this because I'm, I'm trying to be th- th- this is what okay. we're doing I'm trying December, to the root de- is December 20th through the 22nd yeah. I'm going to Ferguson with the Black Association of Attorneys yeah. and we're going to discuss the wrongful death lawsuit and the civil lawsuit yeah and what that should look like, because this is not the only case there. They right. only put this case on the air because they could get away with it. Yeah. If they put the other cases that happened prior to Mike Brown, then things would be a lot more clearer and people would then understand why they're burning the city down. Right. Cause this is not the first time that this has happened. Yeah. The exact same scenario happened three times prior to this in this same year. And we're not hearing about that, but I'm going to talk about it Monday. Yeah. Yeah. We'll talk about it Monday. Okay. Let's quit that. Let's quit that. Okay. Get out of here. Yeah. I'm Cause I'm curious as what's going to happen Sunday with all y'all leaving your churches. And running in the street and, and blocking Lakeshore Drive. City of Chicago like will get rich because yeah. after they finish blocking, they're going to get hungry and go out yeah, to eat right wild. downtown. Yeah, they are. Um, <laughs> though, though we may be a relative minority in this country, African Americans have the spending power of, a, of, a, sm- of a small nation. Yes. yes. No a sense. recent report by Nielsen, uh, a consumer analytical company, the uh, National Newspaper Publishing Association, predict that in 2015, that buying power will amount to one point one trillion at that point. We would be the equivalent of the sixteenth richest nation in the world. Currently thirty three percent of us own smartphones. Twenty three point nine million of us use the internet and the percentage of us attending college or earning a degree has increased to forty four percent for men, fifty three percent for women. Stats also found in the report released uh, September twenty two at the forty first annual legislative Congressional Black Caucus Foundation Conference. The report also brings light on the need for positive messages by companies and the need to invest within the company, uh, the community. Scholars and econo- uh, economists have long wanted uh, or waned about the perpetual of spending money the, uh, the minute it's made in African American homes. So are we really surprised by the numbers? Black money leaves black hands almost as soon as it gets there. Hmm. So how powerful are our dollars and who benefits? How can we leverage our spending power to make our communities better? And, 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 and yeah, it is mental. It really is. Get that. My son, Walter Jr., is, is one of the smartest men I know. He ain't between three and 24, okay? But he, when he gets his money, he keeps it. He holds on to that sucker. And then what he does is he'll give it to somebody in need. He's been like that since he was eight years old. Mm. I've seen him literally just put all his money every week in the offer in the, in, the, in the church. I said, "Son, okay, you got to hold some of that money." Right. You know, I know, I know God is good and what yada yada yada. I said, "But some of that money, I said, I gave that to you for you. You can't give it all away." And so since that time, he's been holding on the money. He spends it when he needs it, when he needs to, or he or he takes care of his sister. His little sister. Because he has a dad teaching Mm -hmm. him that money is a tool. Mm -hmm. It's not a goal. Yes. I don't make money because that's all I'm worth. I'm worth more than money. Right. And until we get people to understand that, then as soon as they get their hands on my my grandmother used to call that money burning up in your pocket. 
right. is burning your pocket up. Burning a hole in your pocket. Because when you are lacking certain uh, mental capacity, yeah. you get power from spending. Yeah. My, my wife used to call me the swiper because I used to ching, ching, ching. The swiper. I, 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 you know, I'd swipe, you know, feeling good about buying something. But God is teaching us that swiper, we have to no use swiping. money as a tool. Yeah. If I take it and use it as a tool, I can invest it and get more money and then I can make a sizable purchase yeah. that's really going to do something for me in the long term versus something temporary where I'm going to have to replace it. We have people sending out for the iPhone 6. Um, this thing is $700. You stand out in the cold, yeah. folk fighting over TVs on Black Friday. Mm-hmm. Like, really? Mm-hmm. Really? Is that yeah. is that where we are is now? That where we're, yeah, that's, like, what we, that's what we've been. Unfortunately. So yeah. what do you think of what I'm about to say? My friend told me this and it just changed my entire outlook when it comes to money. Mm-hmm. She said wealth without wisdom equals poverty. Yes. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. Yeah. Equal, she said equal C. She's yeah, smart. That's she, it. That, that, that bas- that's basically it. Uh, now, wisdom. Now, you, I live in the Roseland area. Yes, okay. Sir. All right. I, I sent you there today. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're Street. <laughs> All right, I sent you that. All right, I walk up and down Michigan Avenue, which used to be in the '60s and '70s, like State Street downtown. Yes. Okay, there were businesses all over the place, and we and you and we dressed up to shop. Well, it used to be a time we used to dress, you dress up to go downtown. Yeah, you, you dressed know. up to go downtown. We used to dress up and go shopping. Uh, now you walk down there, and you got to hold your purse. You got to cover yourself. Okay, you got to watch. You got to look behind you. Okay, because it's, it's it's dangerous to walk and even shop. Well, I'm looking for a barber because my barber was out of town. All right, so I finally find, find a barber on Michigan Avenue. I walk in there. There are four barbers in there. All four of them got dreadlocks. All right, no problem. Okay, hey, it's two each his own. One barber sitting in the chair. I says, uh, uh, I need a haircut. He says, he he ignored me. And I said again, and, and can can you can so you, you come here? I want to go later on. Yeah, can I said, can you can you come here? He says, uh, uh, let, let 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 Bob do it. I turn, I walk over to Bob, which is right next to him. He says, he says, I, I don't know, man. I got, I got about two more, man. Let, let let Joe do it. All right. So I said this. So I said, man, this don't make no sense. So three of them said, Joe, cut his hair. I went over to Joe. Joe is under the hair dryer. Okay, he the barber. He on the hair dryer. And I'm, I stood there for a while. And he looked at me and you know what he said? Can't you see I'm busy? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I said, Walter, just turn around. Get up out of there. Exactly. Just leave. So uh, I I got up. I turned around. <coughs> I walked to the door. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold up, bro. I'll I, I, I cut your hair. Too I'll late. cut your hair. Well, it was the guy in the back. Uh, he heard the commotion and he came from out the back. Now I'm afraid. Cause you know I've seen too many movies where they they give you the guy who can't cut hair, mm-hmm. <laughs> barbershop. <laughs> yeah, you know I'm afraid. Your hair up. So he was so persistent that I said, you know, I got to get my hair cut. It was Saturday, you know, and I, you know Sunday is for musician. That's that's our that's our work day. Yes. Uh, so I sat in there and I, you know got my hair cut. He did a decent job. Took a while, but I'm sitting there thinking, how is this possible that I'm treated like this? Who's well, the I owner? think we need to go back to what she said providing solutions because i want to provide just a couple of solutions um to our dilemma um Mm. and and this is just personal stuff that we did as a church the first thing we did in our church when god began to really deal with us about the economic plight of roseland is he had us create a small business incubator in our church yeah so we those who are small business owners that come to our church if they're a member of our church we take them through the process of understanding business this is what business is. This is what customer service is. This is what profitability is. This is how you can buy at a lower price versus trying to compete with someone bigger than you and then you wind up losing because you're going to have to charge more because you're smaller. This is how you hire people. This is how you identify good help. This is how you schedule. This is how you create cash flow. People think that you're going to have a business, you're going to get a product, and you're just going to start selling stuff and make Mm -hmm. millions of dollars. That's not how it works. works. If you are an entrepreneur, this is just across the board. I don't care if you're black, white, Asian, Hispanic. You don't need to look for a salary for at least five years. Right. 
which means you need to have a program in place to sustain you mm -hmm. until your business becomes solvent. That's your it. your business has to become strong. Multiple streams of income. You need to create relationships yeah. with other business leaders so that you can do bulk buying. This is what the uh, the Arab community does. That's why they have so many of those mom pa liquor stores and stuff sprinkled all through our neighborhood because when they come over here, they bring ten of their cousins and all of them open up stores. Can I put a and pin when in they that? shop, they all shop but together. But can I put a pin in that? Go. They also take advantage of the government in a way that we can. They have several names that are attached to them. They don't have a social security card. Now, I know people who work at Currency Exchange who watch the same person come in four or five times a month and pick up a link card and a check. And they use a link card and go to Aldi's and stock their stores with link card using other people's money. So then there's another political piece. Now, I'm not saying don't look at that model. But you also have to look at the vehicle and the tool that they use to get ahead because it's more than just ABC cut and dry like that. Well, too. they get small business loans, but but here, here's here's no, something. that's not a business loan. That's a gift from the state when you, you're you getting a link card. <laughs> well, they get a small business loan. They get $250,000. They, they sure do. Yeah. And a link card. So, we can't yeah. get $50. So, so sure. our thing is our tools, again, we have relationships. And this is just something that we're attempting to do now because we're having a national conference call on December 19th with small African-American businesses all over the country. This is something that we're doing. We're just asking you to give us your information so we can market your company so people know who you are. Because here's the reality. Most African-American businesses, people have no idea who they are. If you're not right. a big restaurant or if you're not a, you know, um, a big clothing thing. You know, people don't know who you are. Right. So when you first start, you're starting with great intent. But if you don't understand that dimension, we have to rally around that. And so that's something we did. One of our um, graduates from our school, uh, she does the butter cookies. We were mm -hmm. eating her cookies. Like, man, what are you doing with this? Mm -hmm. She's like, nothing. Mm -hmm. We took it. Regina, took are her, you listening? We took her through the small business mm -hmm. incubator. Now mm -hmm. she's in 26 sitcoms and 19 Walgreens. Good. Now what we're doing as a church mm -hmm. is we're looking for a commercial space. Yeah. Because now we're going to take what she's doing in her home with her and her four children, and we're going to put it in a commercial space. We're going to take eight people from our church, and then we're going to commercialize <laughs> this thing, and we're going to keep building it up until it's Oreo. But you have to have the mindset. You have to have people that are willing to put the work in. You're not going to be a millionaire overnight. That's good. And one of my favorite shows to watch on TV today is called Shark Tank. I love that show, and I think the churches can learn from Shark Tank. Because you can get somebody in your community or your church or who has this, in, this idea, even the cookies, okay? Your wife, Alvin, the cookie the situation. And you got people, all, all these people who've made it on the panel who can pour into this woman and show her from from the bottom on to the top how to do it? And because you notice the questions that they ask the people who are standing, you know, they ask yes. them the, the specific questions. The, the real business questions. Business yes. questions. How much does it cost Your market. You? Yeah. How much it, do yes. you make from it? Yeah. How much have you made already? And there you go. Exactly. And then and then sometimes one will say, "I'll take you." Then then one will say, "I'm gonna go in with Alvin." The both of us will take you to another level, okay? Because Alvin is into uh, uh, maybe uh, the, the marketing area, but me, I'm, I'm in the manufacturing area, okay? And then we both can help you. That's something that we could we could do. When I did my concert last year, uh, July, you were yes, there. Yes, yes. I thought about doing a, a one man stand, you know, you know, okay. the, you know, the one man thing, mm -hmm. you know, the piano is me. I said, no, fool, you 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 are an opportunist. You you the guy that gives opportunity to people, so it went from being a one night uh, with one guy to I had a full band. Yes. Okay. I brought other groups and choirs in, and th they they were not free. Okay. Okay. I was paying. Them. Yeah. I was paying them. I paid the band, and I paid other people, and I paid for catering, and I paid for the bill, and I paid for this, I paid for that. I wanted to give opportunity to everybody who was doing something that's exposure. In the, that was exposure. And his network. Absolutely. Now, so the and bills relationship. There you go. And the, uh, the and the money, the offerings that I raised that night, uh, I, I I only broke even. Actually, I was in the red, but it didn't matter. It didn't matter to me because what I did, I gave opportunity to those people there. That's value. It, yes. But it paid off afterwards because a DVD comes out of that. Exactly. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So even though it seemed like I lost that night, over a period of time. It was a seed planted. It, there you go. Yes. And you yes. planted a watermelon seed. Mm -hmm. There right. you go. <laughs> and, and, and that's the yeah. thinking that we have to have as businessmen. Yeah. 
what, what happens in the church is we over spiritualize everything. We pray in tongues. We rode around the church. Hey, bah, 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 mm-hmm. bah, bah, bah. But then we totally ignore the business. We totally ignore recognizing a certain gift. Now, here is Walter Jones. He's probably one of the top five piano players in this entire city, which is saying a lot compared, you know, given the type of musicians we have here. Okay, now let's take a guy like this and put an instruction video together yeah. and put it out. Put it out. Webinars yeah. right now yep. are making billions of dollars, yep, and most of the people that are doing the webinars mm-hmm. have never done what they're teaching. That's they true. learned how to teach it, but they've never done it. A lot like preachers, yep. but I ain't going to say nothing. That's, <laughs> that's coming on Monday. It comes back to duplication. That's it. Infomercials are full of people who are telling you how to do it, but they've never done it themselves, and they're making money on the sales. Come to my real estate seminar, and I'm going to teach you how to flip houses, but I'm not going to be there. I'm I'm going to have another guy there. That's it. That's it. That's it. You know, Uh, we have a saying in teaching. Those that can, or we started in music, those who can, they do. Those who can't, they teach. Those who can't teach, they administrate. Wow. I hope y'all rewinding this on Spreaker. (laughs) Among cities, uh, New York City has the most black-owned businesses with 154,000. That's 8.1% of the nation's black owned, followed by Chicago with 58,631, and then Houston, uh, and then Detroit. Uh, so we're right here within that area. But I, again, I can't walk up and down my neighborhood uh, or uh, Auburn, Gresham, or uh, in the, the, uh, sh- the, what, what's that, Inglewood. I, I'm seeing all these other guys setting up shop. Uh, now, let me ask y'all a question on the panel mm-hmm. Is poverty systematic? Do you think poverty is systematic? Definitely. Okay. Absolutely. Now, yeah. Now, there are certain groups out there, organizations, who should be a little more responsible, but they're not. And there, there are also very, there are millionaires and billionaires that are out there. Even here in Chicago, we have a lot. We have, we have more millionaires than we can shake. Uh, okay. But you only hear about their millions and what they're doing for, to bring light to them. But they're not uh, giving back. back to the community that... Well, at least at what we think. For instance, look, look, look at Oprah who said, it's my money, I do what I want to. So she went over to Africa, okay? Yes. Built the, the girl's school and what have you. Okay, she says, I said, you know, that's some money, whatever. Uh, but then I looked at all the other well-off black people in Chicago and you don't see the effort of their, their, their wealth. That's in funny. Community. Dempsey Travis said this mm-hmm. uh, some years ago, I remember, and it stuck with me. Early 90s, he says, I'm trying to get all of my black millionaire friends not to leave the city yeah, so that the younger blacks that are coming up can know what we look, look like, like yeah. and imitate us. Yeah, He still has Civ Art Realty on 87th and the Cottage yes, Grove. Yeah. He, if you go down certain streets, um, Indiana, uh, Prairie, between 83rd and 87th, you'll see a whole gated community That's that it. looks like suburbs. Uh-huh. If you go, It's uh-huh. a small gated community yeah. that he built. <laughs> And those those there's a, a small pocket of affluent people there, yep. and they stayed. Um, you don't really see them, but you can see evidence that they're there. Now they're not publicly and in the media, right? Um, and a lot of times, rich people you really never know who they are. And God gave me this phrase, and it stuck with me at that moment. I said, mm, "Fame don't mean fortune." Mm-hmm. That's right. Mm-hmm. And too many times, we as a people want fame, right? Exactly, and not the fortune. Not the fortune. Yeah, that's good. Uh, you look at uh, here's some groups here: the Bilderberg, the Trilateral Commission, Kafilgafish, yeah, the Council of Foreign Relations, the Illuminati. You hear all these terms all the time, okay? <laughs> Leave my people alone. Yeah, and then teasing. and then the Masons, the Freemasons. Yeah, yes. All right. Now, what can Alvin? You're yes. an expert the Mason. You're an expert with them. Yes, okay. I'm a Mason. Can Can you tell me? Nope. Are they responsible? <laughs> he said, Nope. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Nope. There it is. Mm-hmm. See, no. Uh, what was your question? I, I thought it wasn't a secret. See, nope. <laughs> uh, uh, these na- these people I just named plus the Masons, do they have a responsibility to the African American community? Yes, to s- we as I can say this about the Masons, we have a responsibility to the community at large. All right, that's a part of our our foundational teaching. Okay, brotherly love, relief, sure. truth. I mean, these are things that we do. We charity, friendship, love, you know, faith, hope, charity. All of that is a part of us because we're biblically based. Right. One of the problems is we don't broadcast the things that we do um, okay. Okay. because it's not about us doing it as long as it gets done. Good. Good. As long as it gets done. Um, me, myself, I'm work, uh, hoping to work with some economical ideas so that we can empower our own brothers 
and our and brothers can empower their families and then their families can empower a community because it takes us one at a time if I can get the three of us in this room rich then each one of us can reach three other people that's true that's true <coughs> we want to do it too fast how do you well I'm getting into my controversial corner I'm going to hush uh, speaking of that's what we're going into the controversial corner as I get my controversial cough out of there uh, if you just join us, this is the Sir Walter Jones Show. We're talking about black finance. We're talking about the power of African American money. What do we do when we get that paycheck? When the eagle fly today, today's Friday, the eagle mm-hmm. phone, bring that check home. What you gonna do with it? Do you mm-hmm. go straight out there to get those uh, Air Jordans? Do you go out there and get get your suit, get whatever because you want to look good, or do you take that money and put it in the bank and let it multiply? Or do you invest into the community? What are you doing with your money? Okay, let's talk about this on this last half hour of the show. We're going to Converge Corner right here on UBM Praise. Log on to urbanbroadcastmedia.com and check out the many services Urban Broadcast Media provides. Whether it's social media, video production, radio broadcasting, or audio recording, we got you covered. The following show is paid programming and does not necessarily express the views and opinions of Urban Broadcast Media and its subsidiaries. Thank you for listening to UBM Praise. Your spirit, God, and let your word abide. Speak to my heart, Lord. Oh, my heart. Give me your holy word. Your holy word. If I can't hear from you, if I can hear, then I know you, what to do. Then I know what to do. I won't go on. I'm gonna go on. 
Controversy Corner on the Sir Walter Jones Show here on UBM Prince. Hello, this is Keep It Real Carter here at the Controversy Corner at the intersection of the Black Buck and your broke. Oh, anyway. Let's talk about this. How come black folk ain't got no jobs, ain't got no businesses? How come we are at the bottom of the economic totem pole? One, you ever walk into a black business and you got that girl chewing gum, you know the one, Byron! The image that's before us is not appealing. And what do we do? We don't go back. Or those that go back, go back just because. So there's a problem with customer service. Owners of these businesses, quit settling on who you offer jobs to and demand some excellence out of them. Quit letting these boys wear saggy pants to work, pulling down their coats to cover their behind because it's cold rather than pulling their pants up. Well, that's another discussion. Then, the kindness. When your customer complains, what happened to the customer's always right? How come only the white customer's always right? How come the black one not? You act like you don't care if we never come back. Then the quality control. Quit selling us junk. We come in, we purchase, and then it's not any good. Or if it doesn't work right, you say, well, too bad, all sales are final. Then you wonder why you finally ain't got nothing else to sell, because ain't nobody buying nothing from you. Quit charging too much for your service. Is nothing. One of the other reasons why we go other places is because we can get it for a better price. And finally, sell something we can that we need, not necessarily something that we want. I can't stand it when a brother talking about I got these socks for sale, got these towels for sale, and you stole them. So that's another thing. People quit stealing from your black people. Quit taking from each other. So what are you saying? Stop being rude. Stop being cheap. Stop being overpriced. Stop and. St- Start being kind to your customers. Start having a better curb appeal. Walk into your store and your your, your place of business and it smells funny, it looks funny. Or it just is not complete in its image. In other words, the face of your brand is just as important as the quality of your brand. What did Zenith say? The quality goes in before the name goes on? Well, how come what on the outside don't look good as what's supposed to come from the inside? And usually what's on the outside reflects the inside. Another thing, fame don't mean fortune. I know I said it earlier. Quit trying to make a name for yourself. Make a name for your grandson. Give your grandchild's name value. 
We still know Mr. Sears, and he been dead a long time. We used to talk about his partner, Roebuck, but he got deleted. Roebuck was a black man. And now that leads me to this point. What's wrong with partnership? What's wrong with building, helping someone else? There's nothing wrong with people doing it together. I don't see any business names where there's two names together. What happened to such and such? What happened to it being just one, I mean, two names or more incorporated? How come we can't work together for a common goal? If we don't get it together, we'll never get ahead. Is that controversial enough for you? Yeah, that's my controversial corner. Quality goes in before the name goes out. I, controversial corner right here on You Being Praised, the Walter Jones Show. Um, I want to put uh, Apostle David Rogers on the spot here. Yes, sir. While we were in uh, some of the spiciest conversations happen when we're off the air. You said something that I totally agree with, and I've done a studies on this uh, on numerous times, and <clears throat> I'm preparing something to release about it uh, because that's what I do. I like to get in trouble. I put a video out on, about this whole Church of God in Christ convention thing, and the brother said he was delivered, and, you know, I got I got calls from the top, you know, called my house saying, how dare you? And I, I stood my ground. I didn't care. Um, but you said something very shocking. You said, that the IRS is an illegal entity. It's an illegal entity. Yeah, tell, me, tell us why. Constitutional law, which I studied before I was called to be a pastor, uh, I learned that the IRS was never ratified as an organization. Wow. The taxes that the IRS uh, takes from people, uh, which the uh, city of Chicago, state of Illinois, has the highest taxes uh, of any place right. in the country, and That's we're true. last in debt. We're yes. behind Mississippi. Right. Was only designed to tax corporations and foreign corporations as they uh, imported or exported goods into our country. A personal individual tax is nowhere found in any constitution. Hence, the IRS had to develop its own code, which is called the IRS code. Mm -hmm. It's not a constitutional code. And so when they are collecting taxes from us, personal tax, income tax, sales tax, real estate tax, liquor tax. Now in Cook County, there's a water tax of a dollar and 20 cent if you buy a package of water. I mean, it's ridiculous. Everything is taxed. It is illegal. Yeah, It is illegal. And anybody can research this and find out. If I'm telling you the truth, it is not anywhere found in the Constitution where an IRS entity or an organization was ratified by the United States Constitution. If it is not ratified by the Constitution of the United States of America, it is illegal. So yeah. now you open up a keg of worms. Yeah. Everything That's from the Affordable Health Care Act on down. All of it is buffoonery. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And I've heard white politicians say that over and over again. Uh, and, and it's been ignored. Uh, well, since we're there, because we're talking about economics, the Federal Reserve Bank is an illegal entity. It's well, a privately owned institution. It is not a federal institution owned by the United States government. It is not. Those families that you mentioned earlier own that uh, thing, and that uh, bank is setting the interest rates for all of the banks and for the world because the United States currency now is the reserve currency, which means any dollar on the planet has to match itself against the strength of the U.S. dollar. And now we're at a place where the U.S. dollar is worth negative 36 cents, and China and Japan are now considering merging their dollar to become the reserve currency, which is going to cause hyperinflation for the United States of America. But that's another sure. topic that we need to talk about later, because sure. people need to do research. They don't read, so they think everything is good, and you know we have all these people in place. We need to start doing some research and understanding what's happening globally in economics and why the moves that we need to make we need to make now. We don't have another 20 years to make these types of decisions. That's can good. I ask a Captain obvious question? Sure, Captain. How can you arrest somebody for a law that doesn't exist? Yeah, well, that... Uh, uh, this, when it comes to tax evasion. Because it used to be of the people, by the people, for the people. And unfortunately, we live in an oligarchy, okay? Call the people from the electoral college yeah. from your region and <laughs> ask you them how they can that, do that, it. And that's what I'm saying. Okay, because we're that, not 
It's we're, called taxation without representation. Yeah, there you go. But you, do you remember for, that story mm-hmm. from U.S. history? Taxation without representation. Okay, let's let's take it even further. Which mm-hmm. one of the political parties represent you? None. So why are you being taxed? And why are you a part of that party? <laughs> okay, we need to go even I'm further. Done. Yeah. Who tries cases in the courtroom? Who tries them? Lawyers. Lawyers. Regular people like you and me. However, they say legally. Legally, you don't have to pass the bar to try a case. Right. You can go and try a case. But this bar exam is a test that sees how much you know, how equipped. And it's really not knowledge retention. It is a concept application. In teaching, we have these three disciplines, procedural knowledge, conceptual knowledge, and application knowledge. Hmm. The bar exam takes ambigu- I mean, takes the law and it re- it's written in a certain language. How well can you discern it? So when you pass this test, you have now arrived at a place of brotherhood. It's not. It, it's a fraternity. Mm-hmm. It's a fraternity. <laughs> that judge that's on the bench is a lawyer first. He sure is. Mm-hmm. So they know each other and they communicate with each other. They have these ethics that they su- they're supposed to follow. So the thing is... Can you get a lawyer that's willing to try this case against this law? And what judge is going to hear it or what court is going to hear it? And can you afford to continue visiting the courtroom, paying the fees until it rises past the appellate court until the Supreme Court? And if the, the Supreme Court has this luxury of choosing what cases they really want to hear, trust me, this has been brought to them, but they just keep setting it to the side. This is how economics works. Do you do you know what the letters bar mean? No. It's the British Attorney Registry. That's right. Washington D.C. is a part of the District of Columbia. It's not a part of the United States That's of right. America. Yeah. Do you know what buildings reside in Washington D.C. District of Columbia? IRS, mm-hmm. the FBI, mm-hmm. the CIA the White House, and Congress. Right. Mm -hmm. They cannot be tried in a court of law because they are not U.S. citizens and anything done in that 10 by 10 square foot mile radius against U.S. citizens is considered under the rule of the British Parliament. Mm -hmm. Hmm. When we pay taxes, our taxes are supposed to be going to Great Britain because we are still a colony of Great Britain. Please do not remember all of that American history stuff and think that they told you the truth. All of that's foolishness. Yeah. It's called the British Attorney's Registry, Mm -hmm. and anybody can research that. This is why we're here and we're confused. Why did we have all of these stories about the founding of America? We had the Pilgrim thing, and they cooked turkey, and and they did all of that stuff. Then we had the Christopher Columbus thing, and he never made it even to put his feet on America. And then we have America Vespucci and the slave trade. Now, which one of these are accurate? What was the slave trade about? Was it racial or was it economic? Well, if you have people working for free, for your corporation that you call a country for 300 years, then of course you're going to become a superpower. Any business that you have and you don't have to pay employees, but you're still getting labor, you're going to advance faster than a country that has to pay employees. Mm -hmm. The United States of America is a corporation. That's why you have a social security card. That social security number makes you a part of the British registry. Right. That's why when you go to prison, They get paid per prisoner. That's That's why the prison industrial complex is the new slave trade. That's That's why us is is in jail and in penitentiaries all over the country. More um, penitentiaries are being built than colleges because Mm -hmm. it is the new economy. Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about black economics, we need to talk about the rule of law because it is the rule of law that are imprisoning black men again Mm -hmm. on the slant on the plantation of penitentiary service to the United States of America. And then when you don't know that law, uh, then you will, you, you stay enslaved (laughs) mentally. Okay. And, and, and you're right. Everything around us is, is a, 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 you can't even heat up your house without knowing, uh, without hearing the word British. You know why? Because your furnace is, has, it gives out what's called a BTU, Mm -hmm. a British thermal unit. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) (laughs) You can't even go. I like suits. But the suits that I wear are British cut, okay? Everything we do is about British. Now, watch this. You, earlier, we talked about some finance. Let's, let's, let's talk about this in, the, in, the, in just about the seven minutes we got left. Mm-hmm. Here are the seven stages of an empire. This is what make up like this. an empire, all right? 
by this is by by uh, economist Mike Maloney. All right, this is how Athens, Greece, rose and fell. All right, and every empire had the same thing that happened to them. These seven stages they went through, and America is going through the seven same seven stages. Number one, sound money. That started it all. Sound mm. money. Okay, that means money. The money, that, this dollar that I got. I pull it out, and that dollar is backed by gold or is backed by something, okay? In 1971, uh, they called him Tricky, Tricky Dicky. What was his name? Uh, uh, he's not Richard a crook. Nixon. Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon. I would not do anything. Richard 1972. Nixon. He pulled, he pulled. I am innocent. Took the U.S. off the gold he standard. Pulled, he, he, he pulled off the gold standard, okay? Number two, layers of public works and then social programs. The, the money was used for the social programs and public works. The third stage is uh, build a massive military, all right? Mm -hmm. The fourth stage is take that military and go to war, okay? The fifth stage of an empire is, the, uh, well, currency debasement. That means you have to pay for that war you just launched, mm -hmm. right? Number six is the loss of faith in that, that currency, all right? So you mentioned the dollar. Mm-hmm. Uh, represents how much you said? Negative 36 cents. Okay. All right. That's laws of faith. And then the seventh stage of the empire is currency crisis. Gold accounts for what's called the fiat uh, currency. Now, he, he, the, uh, it, is, it is stated that the United States is in the sixth, almost the seventh stage of the empire, which means we're going down. Um, we, we have what's called the U.S. Treasury. Okay, right. which housed all the gold in the world, all mm -hmm. right, and is it was housed in that pen that jail that penitentiary, uh, Fort with, Knox. Fort Knox. All right, you go to Fort Knox, that's where all the gold is. Okay, now that's just one of yeah, the locations. That one, that's three. That's yeah, where it was. That, that's that's why I say where it's what. Uh, but it was it had more there than anywhere else. Um, mm -hmm. But but New all York has one too. all of the world's gold was there, and what we did was, if you look at your dollar right now. The only value it has is built off of faith. That's it. It's not backed by nothing. Okay. Well, we don't have a dollar anymore. We have what we mm -hmm. call a reserve note. Yeah, that's what it is. It's because a they took they took the authority out of the U.S. Treasury, which was constitutional organization, and they gave it to the Federal Reserve. If you go and study the history of 1913, and I want to encourage everybody to do this: study U.S. history I and economics from 1913 yes, to sir. 1933, and find out what organizations were founded. In 1913, the federal, uh, uh, the, the, the CIA, the uh -huh. FBI, yeah. the Federal Reserve Bank, uh -huh. and what followed, and the IRS. Yes, that's five right. Five years later, World right. War One. Uh huh. Uh huh. And then after that, World War Two. Yes. Korea, Vietnam, and now we're here in two wars that mm -hmm. we're paying ten billion dollars a month, no. fighting people we don't even know. We're not at war. Yes, we are. No, we're not. It's never been declared. It was declared. George no. Bush declared on TV. <laughs> on TV, he's declared but, what? But, 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 here, but here's terror. the problem. Who? But here's the problem. We're fighting. He, a, a, he, he a declared a war on a person who was a CIA CIA operative that he paid. <laughs> but he I can prove it. I was in the United States Army. No. Saddam Hussein is not dead. Osama bin Laden is not dead. These individuals are still alive. I they are that. CIA operatives, and they are in place, just like um, Manuel Noriega. We find out he was a CIA operative yes. running drugs. Yes, all of this stuff. Is lies. Yes. And we better wake up. Nine one one wasn't a guy with a laptop in a cave in Afghanistan <laughs> destroying the United States of America. It was a bad job. The whole NORAD, North American Air Defense, was off that day on September eleventh, right. two thousand one. For the first time in the history of its inception, it just happened to be doing maneuvers off the South Florida, and no fighters were being able to be scrambled to find five planes that were supposedly hijacked. In we no still don't lines. have those planes. We still don't have the bodies. We still don't have any evidence of planes falling at free fall speed into their own footprint. It was the greatest man-made personal deception we've ever experienced on this planet and we better wake up and realize what's happening all right saying it y'all heard it right here on the Sir Joe show it. now i didn't say it they said it because I, <laughs> I, I said don't it. shoot me I, <laughs> I, I, I don't know nothing Come to my house if you want to i don't know nothing all i know is i'm still alive uh <laughs> what is a fiat currency number one any money declared by a government to be legal tender. That means the United States can take this napkin and say, this is now money. <laughs> yes. Okay. And it's backed by nothing but because I said That's it. That's what we got. Uh, number two, state-issued money, which is neither convertible, 
by law to any other thing, nor fixed in value in terms of any objective standard. Number three, intrinsically valueless money used as money because of the government decree. So what that tie you got on, uh, the government say that's now money. Okay, and what that did was that ruined. There was no country in the in the world ever uh, that that succeeded on fiat money uh, because it's not backed by anything. It's something that they decreed. And so so. I, I, I love what you, you mentioned. Nineteen thirteen. Nineteen thirteen. Just just saw a documentary on that and all of the, the establishment. And at that time, uh, what a person could do is he can take that dollar, he can walk right into the bank, and take gold. And take gold. Uh huh. All right. So why do you think all these commercials are give us your gold? What, yes. what do you yeah. think that's about? Uh huh. And you always see it on Fox News mostly. Why, why, why do we always? Why do we see that? Uh huh. These are the things Cash that we gold. have to become yes. aware of. Because while we're fighting and scrambling over in the streets in every major city, <clears throat> we get 600 murders a year here in Chicago over drug dollars. We've got trillion dollars worth of real, <coughs> excuse yeah. me, real money in our home in Africa. And so I want to challenge black business leaders, if that's what you want to call yourself, <laughs> minority business leaders, if that's what you want to call yourself. Get engaged and get invested in global markets. Yeah. The United States of America is $117 trillion in debt. They're only reporting 20. Yeah. That means every uh, American citizen right now, in order to get out of debt, would have to pay somewhere in the neighborhood of $680,000 to get this country out of debt. And we're wow. going, what is it, uh, 1.9 million, I think it's $1.9 million a second uh, <laughs> the United States is spending of our children's Whee! future. And so we need real accountability. <coughs> we need a line by line audit on the United States of America and the Federal Reserve. And if we're going to deal with African economics, then we need to deal with it from the root. And we cannot continue to be ignorant and spend our one trillion as soon as we get it. We need to reinvest it and make that one trillion, ten trillion, or our children will not have a future. That's good. Spend it by the root. Yeah. Uh, uh, and. and uh, it's okay to keep things in the family, y'all. <laughs> you stop taking stuff out of the family. Uh, the top five uh, African American companies uh, in America: number five, Mana Incorporated in uh, Louisville, Louisville, Kentucky, uh, six hundred and thirty million. Uh, Modular Assembly Innovations in Ohio, Dublin, Ohio. Uh, that's I think that's a billion. Uh, Bridgewater in- Interiors in Detroit, Michigan, uh, one billion. Uh, Act. Dash one group. They they're in California, Torrance, California, uh two point two billion. And number one uh African American company, two thousand fourteen is Worldwide Technologies. That's in Maryland Heights, uh, Missouri. That's uh six point four. That's a lot. So if those of you are looking for jobs around the country, there you have it, the top five. <laughs> they killing it, y'all, they're killing it. Um and uh we just we just want y'all to be informed. Rewind this on Spreaker. Um, I don't know, Alan, what you got? I, mean, I got about three minutes. Three minutes. <clears throat> um, but yeah, this has been this has been crazy, crazy informative. Uh, I, uh, I knew that a uh, apostle would bring uh, the noise, and he did. Uh, we didn't kick him out this time, but Monday, sure enough, they're going to evict him out of this yeah. studio. Cause kick we, him out. Yeah, he got to go Monday. We got Aaron Haig is coming back, uh, our white minister from from the the suburbs he's coming to tell us about uh the the racism that he has experienced in, even in his area uh, my brother larry who goes to an interracial church he's going to talk about uh racism as well and the apostle will be back uh he's going to bring us from a point of view of the um yeah you can do that i'm going to be talking about classism okay good classism uh yeah that's yeah. the real word. classes in order Go ahead, Alvin. Give me something real quick. Well, in this conversation about economics, you got one minute. The truth of the matter is this: all our blessings come from God. So we're just gonna do the grand old doxology of praise God from whom all mm. blessings flow. Oh, wrong sound. You got thirty seconds. Go in there, thing. Yes, sir. Here you go. Did it go? It won't go. Oh, have mercy. Technical difficulties. Oh no! All right, there we go. Ah. Ready? 
Ready? Come on, y'all. Praise God. Praise God from all bless. You can sing, David. Sing slow. He can't. <laughs> Next week. Right. Praise him, all creature. 20 seconds. He be low. <laughs> Ten seconds. Praise, Praise God, God. Thank you. <laughs> nine verses. Gold. No, it's one verse. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Men. Gotta go. Monday, Men's Chronicles. <laughs> we'll be here. You'll be here. Go to Spreaker right now. The show will be up. Love you guys. This is the Sir Walter Jones Show. You've been listening to the Sir Walter Jones Radio Show, where he provides you with a biblical perspective for your everyday life. Stay connected to Sir Walter Jones by visiting him online at www.sirwalterjones.com or on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash the Sir Walter Jones Show. Stay tuned until next time with the Sir Walter Jones Show with Sir Walter Jones.